Awesome. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Kaden, and I'm the publisher at Convergence Magazine. And I am so glad that you all are joining us on this live stream. Um, as a quick accessibility note, you can see that we have uh, two ASL interpreters who are joining us this evening, Jonah and Edward. Um, they're going to be swapping out because some of the content is a little dense, um, but we're really glad to be offering some expanded accessibility options for our live events these days. Um, by way of introduction, uh, this event has been over a year in the making. We started building this syllabus as a way of creating greater alignment internally when our audio producer Josh and I started in March of last year, so that we'd all have a solid starting point for our work together. We were poised to launch the syllabus last fall, but as you all know, the events of October 7th and the beginning of Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza meant that we really had to take a step back and make sure we were addressing all of the concerns and questions that even we ourselves had about this year's monumental election. In addition to the seventh unit that specifically addresses the US relationship with Israel and its impact on our elections, uh, we deepened a lot of the content, added some new stuff that we'd been publishing over the past year, um, and really built out uh, the syllabus as it is today. The syllabus is really a response to what is a deeply grave moment for us. Uh, we're, teetering on the, we're teetering on the precipice of a serious retrenchment of the power of the MAGA right in the United States. And this is also in the context of a broader surge in authoritarianism around the globe. I'm here with two pieces of good news. The first is that we have agency. This fight is not over until it's over, and our primary task at Convergence is to equip our movements, that's all of you, with the tools that we need to win in the short as well as the long term. The second piece of good news is that we are not alone. It's not just the people who are joining for this live stream, who read Convergence regularly, but scores of organizations around the country and the millions of people who are deeply worried about deepening authoritarian trend in the United States and globally. With that, I am very excited to welcome two of our editorial board members uh, to walk through some of the big ideas in the syllabus, introduce the concepts to you, um, and talk about uh, where this came from. The Convergence Editorial Board is super hands-on. Um, they're not like a sort of traditional nonprofit governing board. They help set both our direction in terms of systems and governance, but also critically our political perspective. We all work closely together in most things at Convergence, and it's not an exaggeration to say that one of the main reasons I joined this team is to work with all of them and to learn from them uh, because they really have such a deep, uh, and broad set of expertises, knowledge, and experience. Um, so it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Sandra, um, who is one of our editorial board members, and she's also the managing director for the Commonwealth Foundation for Inclusive Democracy, and also Whitney, who is a Convergence board member doing uh, the work of building independent political power in North Carolina. Um, welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Caden. Uh, yeah, glad to be here um, and glad to be uh, present in some way with all of you that might be watching this uh, either live or um, the recorded version. Um, so I wanted to start by just kind of asking a, a set of questions that maybe um, some to all of you are asking yourselves. So how do we make sense of the moment we are in? where authoritarianism is in the streets and on the ballot. Progressive Democrats are bringing primary, or excuse me, are being primaried by centrist forces. People around the world are rallying for a ceasefire in Gaza. And few of us are enthusiastic about the prospect of another Biden versus Trump race. How do we understand the election season as part of a longer term struggle to fight the right while creating possibilities for a progressive future? So putting the 2024 elections into a broader strategic framework, we see it not as Biden versus Trump. Instead, it's authoritarian domination versus opportunities for us to continue, continue building a multiracial working class movement uh, that can bring about a true, inclusive, authentic democracy. So 
So I'm going to give an overview of the uh, curriculum and then Sa uh, Sandra and I will kind of give a little bit of a deep dive on what each part of the curriculum is. Uh, so the block and build curriculum is designed to offer analyses to inform our tactics and strategy to locate the current election cycle within our efforts to build state-based independent political power that can drive a new progressive cycles in our cities, states, and nationally. The curriculum helps us evaluate the power we have now relative to mainstream forces and the right with clarity about what's at stake and what could be possible. The block and build syllabus covers the MAGA threat uh, what we need to do to push back this threat, who we need to build power with in order to defeat MAGA at the ballot box and beyond, also known as the broad front. Uh, and this front includes both centrist as well as moderate conservatives. The role that progressive forces play in this broad front and how we navigate tensions as we work with forces that have different motivations and principles than us. The crisis in Gaza and U.S. policy features, excuse me, and U.S. policy failures provide an immediate example of how hard and necessary the work to block and build is at this moment. Most importantly, this curriculum is meant to serve as a basis for principled debate that helps us hone in on our strategic decisions that we face as we continue to build independent political and governing power. Why this matters. Since 2016, much of the left has moved beyond abstentionism, and it made a difference in 2018, 2020, and the 2020-2022 elections. Today, some are understandably disheartened and frustrated in questioning whether electoral work is worth it. I can recall several conversations that I've been a part of recently where people have, uh, in some cases, been in tears or just been visibly agitated and frustrated and, and just kind of um, very demonstrative in the fact that why does it feel like we are stuck in this loop where we feel like we're faced with the same decision at the top of the ticket um, and holding all of those very real and very understandable emotions while also saying, I think it's important for us to uh, make the types of decisions to defeat the right at the ballot box this year that open up opportunities for our movements uh, to be able to build the power that we desperately need. Um, thank you, Whitney. Um, I'm also very pleased to be here with all of you. This slide gets us into the MAGA danger. MAGA is the main dynamic shaping our politics today. It is authoritarian, it is Christian nationalist, it's a growing threat, and it's not just Trump. MAGA is the manifestation of a 60-year backlash against the gains of social justice movements for workers' rights, for civil rights, for women, for LGBTQ communities, for the environment, for redistributive justice, social welfare, fair taxation, and more. Next slide. The growing backlash that we, I mentioned before, the 60-year backlash, here are the phases. So we start with Nixon's Southern strategy, where he used a backlash against civil rights gains to capture Dixiecrats or the uh, Southern Democrats who were white and outraged about civil rights gains. He also used a racially coded law and order narrative and initiatives. So on to Reagan and his neoliberal attacks on regulations and public spending. Then there was Gingrich with his rule or ruin, calling all of his opponents uh, illegitimate and corrupt, and his contract with America. Now, alongside this, there was a bipartisan war on drugs and an incarceration crisis, which impacted so many communities. After 9-11, we had the never-ending war on terror. And then in response to Obama's election, birtherism, and then the fallout from 2008 financial crisis included the rise of the Tea Party 
in 2010 and also a Republican sweep of Congress at that time. And now since 2016, MAGA, the MAGA danger, which yes, is bigger than Trump. These phases of backlash coincided with the rise of neoliberalism. And as neoliberal failures became more evident, especially in 2008, the establishment was discredited and some groups turned to the right. We'll talk more in a minute about why that happened. What does MAGA's rise to power look like today? Well, it looks like total capture of a major Democratic Party, the Republican Party, control of the Supreme Court, influencer control in 23, at least 23 states, capture of the House of Representatives and a stalemate there, emboldened white supremacists who use violence, and bold plans to move us toward fascism if MAGA regains the White House. Now, if they should gain full power in 2025, they will use the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 as their playbook to bring every federal agency directly under the president's control, which means most of them will be gutted, turn the Justice Department into his political police, going after those who try to hold him accountable, and also coming after folks like us, uh, making the Environmental Protection Agency a tool of the fossil fuel industry, turning the National Labor Relations Board into a union-busting weapon, if it even survives, codify a national abortion ban, increase attacks on LGBTQ communities and roll back hard-won gains, further shred the social safety net, impose Florida-style book banning, restrict history curriculum so that we can't talk about our racial justice struggles, and a whole bunch of other things. Truly a fascist-leaning program. Next slide. So who is MAGA? MAGA is anchored in two powerful constituencies, economic elites who are in business and government. This includes billionaires, financiers, industry leaders, and others who espouse right-wing and in some cases, libertarian politics. And then there's a middle strata and working class contingent that is animated by race, gender, and class grievances. Yes, there are workers, especially white workers, who back MAGA. But calling it a working class movement is a bit misleading. It doesn't really tell us how MAGA taps in to those grievances. So they do that because there are demographic changes that the right manipulates to make a fear of the other. There are increased hardships caused by the financial crisis of 2008. The middle got hit very hard. They thought they were on an upward trajectory and they got knocked off. So who is to blame? MAGA gives them an answer. There's a rise in grievance politics that goes along with this, which is also related to a narrative that white men are falling behind because the system favors the other. And they also say this about rural and small town life. Traditional gender roles and shifting gender roles have been happening alongside of greater economic precarity, which also further fuels grievances towards women and LGBTQ people. There's also been a 40 year decline of unions in large part due to sustained neoliberal assaults. Unions, this matters because unions are the place where working class people across race get together and talk about politics. And it needs to be said that there's been a failure to deliver for working people on the part of both parties. I'll turn it back to you, Whitney. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna uh, spend a little time talking about the anti-MAGA forces, right? 
Um, so this kind of anti-MAGA majority began to emerge um, as a semblance of what could be a cohesive thing in the 2020 elections. Um, and so this is what we generally refer to when we're talking about the broad front. Within this broad front, we've identified three general tendencies. One are centrist Democrats or corporate Democrats. Two, the anti-MAGA conservatives. And three, the rising progressive movement. Our basis for being in a front together is our shared strategic objective, defeat MAGA. The centrist Democrats and anti-MAGA conservatives are in the lead of that front for now, but they cannot defeat MAGA on their own. They need us and we need them in order to achieve our strategic objective. We saw this most clearly in 2020. So one of our tasks is to further the growth and consolidation of this front for the 2024 elections. So while progressives are building this front, we must also work to eventually lead it. To illustrate what social justice forces contributed to in 2020, take a look at Power Concedes Nothing. Grassroots get out the vote efforts made the difference in places like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and other states that all helped determine the outcome of the elections that year. A progressive trend in electoral politics has been evolving since 2016. Trump's win demonstrated how elections have consequences and how fragmented and weak progressive forces are in terms of the power to win consistently at scale. At the same time, Bernie's campaigns, 2016 and 2020, showed us the potential of electoral engagement. And since 2016, a growing number of progressive groups have been experimenting and building alliances to gain governing and political power at the local and state levels. Part of this means navigating all the complications of coalitional politics. MAGA authoritarianism is the main enemy that must be defeated because it poses the most dangerous threat to progressives' ability to build uh, and bring about a true multiracial, multigender democracy. But centrist and conservative allies within this front uh, against MAGA do not share the depth and breadth of systemic change that we progressives do. We must keep growing in our sophistication to know when to struggle with centrist and conservative forces in the front, for example, opportunities to primary corporate Democrats, and when to unite with them, for example, codifying Roe versus Wade or to defeat a MAGA candidate. Our aim is that the curriculum will aid our thinking of when to unite and when to struggle based on time, place, and conditions. All right, Slash just did a little dance. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, I wanna be clear, right? We wanna be clear as convergence. There are limits to US democracy and they are most apparent in the structure of the electoral system. The Electoral College and the US Senate give undue power to small, largely white states. The unlimited role of money skews the system in favor of the rich. The winner take all um, system limits the rise of new voices. Single member districts make the two party system less democratic than proportional representation and multi party systems. And MAGA is aiming to make this bias system even more restrictive and less democratic. We're talking voter suppression and gerrymandering. They openly boast about restricting voting rights for communities of color while denying their restrictions on working people. They've also gotten more public about calling for a, a kind of strong man leader or a dictator. They're using the courts to take away rights and reverse rulings. They're breaking the rules altogether by challenging or overturning legitimate election results or trying to create laws that allow them to do that more easily. 
MAGA's other attacks on our democracy include restrictions on protests, legislation against boycotts, book banning, going after politicians, students, and others who demand a ceasefire is a current example that some of us may be all too familiar with. Rollbacks of freedom of speech and the freedom to assemble that hamper workers and communities' abilities to build power and defend their rights and improve their living conditions. And they're reacting to neoliberalism's, neoliberalism's waning power by further limiting government's capacities to redistribute wealth. If they have it their way, they would love to see obscene concentrations of wealth and power and seeing that as a good thing. We know that many people are alienated from electoral politics and a large percentage of those are alienated from politics in general. Still, the vast majority of people who do engage in politics do so via electoral participation. And elections are a critical terrain for gaining control over governance and the economy. We'll need to work both inside and outside electoral politics in order to build the kind of power that we need. Mass movements on their own cannot end or change our electoral system's many undemocratic features. We need to gain enough strength within legislative, executive, and judicial br branches in tandem with mass, mass movements outside pressure to do two things. One, we wanna be able to defend the hard won gains that are being eroded for civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ plus rights, economic and environmental justice gains, you name it. And then second, we wanna be able to shape and win major popular democratic reforms. Currently, progressives are on the defense now because of the MAGA juggernaut and the lack of an organized viable alternative to them. We have junior partner status within the broader front, again, for now. However, our ability to have a maximally inclusive political agenda that is a clear alternative to both MAGA and corporate Democrats and building state-based political and governing power in more places will create the conditions for us to potentially be leading the front. So the fight for representation and governing power will not be won through elections alone. To gain power in electoral and legislative arenas, we need base building, labor organizing, and institution building. We need a full spectrum of tactics and actions that allow us to shift narratives, shift power relations, and people's belief about what's possible through strikes, mass protests, mutual aids, creative uses of the arts, and so many more things. The convergence syllabus goes deeper into all of these forms of political struggle. Passing it back to you, Sandra. Thanks, Whitney. <clears throat> As Whitney says, excuse me, there is a progressive trend. This is the good news. We're going to talk a little bit more about that now, what it looks like in the states. States matter because we have a federated system. We know that MAGA has created strongholds in the Sun Belt, the South, and parts of the Southwest. We hear a lot about states like Florida and Texas, where we know that MAGA officials are ruling as authoritarians, straight up authoritarian. We want to lift up some examples now where progressive forces are aligning to gain governing power. So, for example, in Michigan in 2022, they won major reforms around democracy and reproductive rights, even when people said voters don't care about democracy. In Wisconsin, anti-MAGA voters changed the makeup of their Supreme Court in 2023 and now they have a more fair electoral map. And in Minnesota, thanks to 20 and more years of alliance building to gain governing power, they won a raft of progressive legislation in 2023. Just incredible uh, progressive reforms. And also in Virginia in 2023, 
they won major democratic reforms as well. And all of these efforts represent strategic alliance building and long-term plans to win governing power in the states. So nationally, if we go to the national slide, there we are. Um, it, the national trend looks good too. For the first time in decades, left forces are part of a national governing coalition. We have movement champions like the squad and allies in the progressive caucus and some progressive adjacent uh, legislators as well. And progressives have an electoral infrastructure that is growing in sophistication, that is organizing winning elections, articulating alternative, uh, lifting up alternative uh, candidates and uh, translating our agendas into new laws and programs. Now, these groups include the Working Families Party, Our Revolution, Justice Democrats, Progressive Democrats of America, and more. We have a long way to go, but we are in the game. And speaking of being in the game, we have to deal with the Democratic Party. For now, we need to work within the Democratic Party, even as we build our independent power. And we have to do this for three reasons. One, we're still forced to function under a winner-take-all two-party electoral system, and that will be the case for the foreseeable future. Secondly, where we can, we use elections to primary centrist Democrats to lift up progressive champions and in critical races where necessary, we elect MAGA's Democratic opponents, no matter who those Democrats are, right? And thirdly, the constituencies with the most at stake in the kind of change we're trying to make, working people, people of color, women, LGBTQ, and most of our allies currently engage in politics through the Democratic Party. So struggling to increase the progressive influence and to move the party's center of gravity to the left, to restrict the power of money and corporations, anything we can do to um, <clears throat> increase our power within the Democratic Party, these are our tasks as we block and build. So how do we break the stalemate that Magus currently has as we've seen in the House of Representatives for the last two years. For 2024, our immediate task is to block MAGA from gaining total control and to block them from enacting their crazy uh, agenda. And blocking MAGA is not enough. We need to deploy, as, as Whitney said, we need to deploy a full spectrum of tactics. So we wanna do this in ways that create greater division within the GOP. And we want to gain more strength for progressives in the broad front. We also want to build more leverage relative to centrist Democrats within the broad front. We have some key non-electoral tasks as well, supporting and building a vibrant labor movement. Shout out to those who have, are revitalizing the labor movement now. <clears throat> and also to support community organizing and the organizing revival, shout out for that. Organizing and participating in mass demonstrations for justice, as so many of us are doing right now, and strengthening movement infrastructure at every level. We wanna consolidate the progressive trend to shape and advance an overall progressive agenda. And the more effective we are at doing that today, the better our prospects are for taking the offensive tomorrow. Back to you, Whitney. Okay, y'all, we're rounding the bend. <laughs> um, so foreign policy has long been the biggest point of division within the centrist and progressive wings of the anti-MAGA coalition. And U.S. policy toward Israel-Palestine is one of its most volatile aspects in this moment. The Biden administration is the Israeli government's main international backer. The administration offers rhetorical nods to protect Palestinian civilians and has begun to disagree in some ways with Netanyahu and his administration, but is still sending arms and aid for the Israeli right-wing authoritarian state. Meanwhile, the Republican Party is 100% behind 
the state of Israel and driving in a driving force in the campaign to silence all voices who support Palestinian rights or to silence those who call for a ceasefire in Gaza. And progressives are feeling the tension between support of pal supporting Palestinian rights and a permanent ceasefire today while making the longer term strategic decisions to block, mag block the MAGA movement at the ballot box this November by voting for certain corporate Democrats, perhaps like Joe Biden. So the crisis in Gaza means we must act in multiple ways for the election and beyond. And what we're putting out today is by no means meant to be an exhaustive list. But in terms of blocking, we want to block the GOP's drive to call all ceasefire mobilizations and Palestinian solidarity work anti-Semitic and to make it functionally illegal. We also want to block the GOP and the mainstream establishment's drive, which includes many corporate Democrats, to provide the Israeli government with a blank check and weapons, no strings attached. So how might we build? Well, upon the growing sentiment for Palestinian rights within the Democratic Party, we want to help foster that. The potential leverage and political pressure we gain from mass mobilizations and, for example, the impacts of the uncommitted votes in several states, which is having an impact on Democratic Party leaders who are questioning whether to continue their support for the Israeli government and the genocide in Gaza, we also can build uh, an understanding among those in motion to demand a ceasefire and Palestinian rights to throw down hard to beat MAGA forces in November. Progressive's ability to build and lead within a front to push MAGA back to the margins will eventually position us to push for major changes in US foreign policy. The fight against MAGA is part of the fight for Palestinian rights. Over to you, Sandra. All right, folks, we are at the final slide. And for this one, I just want to read this quote from Nicholas O'Rourke, Philadelphia Council Member at Large and Working Families Party representative, who gave their uh, response to the State of the Union address. He said, block and build. Block the far right while building the power we need to challenge corporations and make change in people's lives. Blocking the right isn't enough. It never has been, which is why we build independent political power for working people that bends the art toward justice. So I want to leave us on that note that uh, the building part is where the hope is. While we work to block MAGA through the broad front, we're also building and strengthening progressive leadership. We're expanding our multiracial, gender inclusive bases, strengthening our institutions <clears throat> to build up the progressive trend, to move our nation toward a progressive cycle. We can do this onward. And now take it away, Caden. Uh I gotta say, y'all are really cute with the way that you've been uh, passing off uh, who's who's speaking. I appreciate you. Um, that's a lot to take in, y'all. Uh, there's a lot of big ideas here that I think are, you know, they're still kind of in the process of being lived out. We are trying to learn through this process what this is going to look like and build the future as we're moving towards it. We also, I mean, I also think that one of the things about leadership is you don't ask people to do what you yourself are not prepared to do. And in the spirit of that, um, I want to welcome our producer, Josh, uh, onto the program. Um, Josh and I started working at Convergence, both of us, early last year. Um, and we come from pretty different professional backgrounds. Um, Josh is our audio producer. Um, has a mind for politics and has been involved in uh, local organizing in Cincinnati. Um, but my background as somebody who's led in like a national base or a national online organizing group, uh, this is very different. And it's also very different from the political backgrounds of a lot of the folks on our editorial board. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we used the syllabus, or rather a previous iteration of it, internally at Convergence, um, and uh, the things that it's kind of made possible for our team um, in the very short time we've, we've been working together. Um, so Josh, welcome. Uh, it's nice hey. to see you. <laughs> hey, Caden. <laughs> I see you a Josh lot is... in this space. <laughs> yeah, we do see each other a lot lately. Josh has also been behind the scenes flipping slides and uh, moving mm -hmm. featured speakers around. So it's funny to get him in front of the camera and not just behind it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Josh, uh, what would you say that your back before coming to Convergence, what would you say your background on these political ideas were? Um, and uh, what did you what did you learn in the process of studying the syllabus with us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is a interesting question to answer is like I, I was sort of like born and raised in the world of local politics. Um, it was like the family business. I was out hanging door knockers for my grandpa when I was nine years old, you know, running for city council. So uh, it's, you know, I, I was raised in households where it was always like we were of the left, you know, left of center or the Democratic Party, maybe a little bit. Um, but I ideolo ideologically always was, I think, a lot further left than that. And, you know, there was some like media and reading that I could find out there and then 2015 2016 this guy named bernie sanders hits the presidential uh campaign stage and all of a sudden it's safe to talk about ideas for the left of the democratic party um but i still didn't really know like how to uh make a cohesive idea that i could like act politically off of from that momentum other than uh, make calls for Bernie, text for Bernie, you know, uh, and then it was kind of the same through 2020. Um, and all the ideas that we covered in the syllabus, um, because there's a lot of uh, great readings that are in there um, that sort of fill the backbone of the stuff you just saw, like Whitney and Sandra talking about um, and give a lot more detail and ideas. Uh I, I was reading it as we were going through the syllabus last spring and I was like, oh, OK, there's other people who see things the same way I do. And we have a bit of a plan for it. And like, I mean, honestly, like the idea of block and build boils down to and I'm stealing this from one of our board members mentioned in a meeting recently is like it's basically saying let's walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think for folks like myself i you know i live in cincinnati so there's not a lot of left movement here um so it's it's hard to find people that are like engaged in things and you end up online a lot and you see corners where there's a sect that says you know we need to really take drastic action towards like some big revolution now and then there's often i'll, I'll say this is kind of like my my parents set you know the folks who are like it's all about Donald Trump. He's the only thing that's ever been wrong with the American system of democracy. And we just get rid of him and it's fine. Um, and there's a lot of us that understand it's both, you know, or something, some matter of both. Uh, and the block and build syllabus just really locked it all together in a way that you can, I think, work in, in your organization internally really well because uh, not to like toot our own horn, but like we did this uh, as a project where we would come together with the readings and discuss and you find out where there's alignment, um, where there's some disparate uh, ideas and where you s sort of drift from each other. And uh, how does that impact us in terms of like as a publisher editorially? Um, and it honestly, we were doing these on late Friday afternoons for me. And I just had fun. It'd be like 6.30 on a Friday. I'd be like, I'm just having fun talking with everybody, getting these ideas out. Um, so I, I strong recommend for like internal organizational use. Fantastic. Um, I guess you sort of answered my second question, which was about how it's shaped your work at Convergence and beyond. Um, but I don't know if you have a quick, uh, quick little anecdote about um, how it's been of use to you and your work with us. Um, yeah, I could still speak to like how it impacts me like day to day as a producer, um, is that 
if there is ever, you know, because we we produced dozens of podcast episodes last year and it doesn't happen often. We have uh, some great folks we work with. But if there is ever editorially a, a question about uh, is this what we think represents convergence and sort of like the coalition building we want to be doing, um, there's this foundational strategy that I can go back to. And now that we're actively like publishing it for other folks to use, it's like it's right there. It's on the website. This is sort of uh, where we hold um, what needs to happen, you know, to stop this bizarre Christo fascist movement that I've been watching gain steam basically my whole life. Right. <laughs> um, and it's getting to uh, kind of scary proportions. So having that as like an editorial backbone is very useful. Um, and um, I don't know how much we want to tease what we're launching, but. <laughs> Yo, people uh, are already asking for it in the chat. People are stoked, which I love. <laughs> yes, the like official quote unquote block and build podcast with Caden as host, me producing is launching this week. Go subscribe now. There's links in the show notes. But um, I mean, it's we're already like sort of doing pitch meetings where we say what is happening this week that people are discussing. And it's like, here's how they're being distracted by it. But what do we think they need to know that they can begin to actually organize so that they can be working to block Trump from getting reelected, the continuation of the MAGA movement, or to build their local organization or their local movement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so like it's it's really, I don't know, the I just lucked out that this is what we've been working on the last year because it uh sort of ideologically brought things that I've been wrestling with my whole life together and gave me a place to work on them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, we are going to transition now into. We're going to transition now into um, some remarks from a really important organizational partner of ours. Um, I'm really delighted that Emily Jaming Lee is able to join us this evening. Um, Emily is the executive director of Seed the Vote. Um, and she also serves as, as a strategic advisor at San Francisco Rising. Um, for those of you who don't know Seed the Vote, Seed the Vote is a volunteer mobilization powerhouse that was formed in 2019 to defeat Trump and has six, since knocked on hundreds of thousands of doors to elect progressive champions and block the right. Um, I'm really happy that Emily is able to join us and talk a little bit about Seed the Vote's work both in the past and what they're up to this year. Um, as they engage in the work of Block and Build. Welcome, Emily. Thanks so much, Kaden. Um, can we pull up my slides, Josh? Thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how Seed the Vote is actually implementing the Block and Build strategy this year in our work, which is very uh, closely tied and very aligned to the strategy. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So um, like Caden said, Seed the Vote's mission is to build grassroots political power in battleground states by electing progressive legislators and also to block Trump and MAGA politicians from getting into federal office. And we do that by sending volunteers to door knock and phone bank in battleground races. Um, we also are trying to build our local movement infrastructure and build support grassroots on the ground social justice organizations by placing our volunteers with a local group or with a local union that works year round in these communities um, with the goal of building their long term political power so that we're not just dropping in, but we're actually adding to and supporting and building the capacity of the folks who are on the ground fighting these political fights in really important states. Um, we also have a program called Generation Rising, which develops the leadership of BIPOC young people. Um, and we're gonna be doing that this year as well. Next slide. So how do we actually do this? Um, See the Vote provides direct financial aid for housing and transportation for thousands of volunteers to knock on doors in the most critical states and races. So we will pay for volunteers who, if they can't afford it, to get themselves to, you know, buy the airplane ticket, to, you know, rent a car, to drive to their near swing state um, and be able to stay there for two days, three days, a week, two weeks, um, as long as they're able to give. And we also have an infrastructure where we are recruiting and training and coordinating thousands of these volunteers um, and also several hundred phone banking volunteers. 
Um, we, like I said before, work with local leadership on the ground so that the local organizations who know best what is the strategy we should be using, what is the messaging to talk with voters, they're the ones who are going to be um, driving that. And we are connecting our volunteers with these powerful local groups. So um, next slide. So in terms of block and build, um, like all the folks earlier have said very eloquently, we are trying to implement the strategy to block MAGA's bid for power um, on the federal level and also build up our own progressive clout so we actually have enough progressive power to be implementing the types of policies and change we want to see on all levels. Um, we're really excited to partner with Convergence Magazine and work with other social movement organizations to implement the strategy, which we believe is the best able to address the current moment and the threat of fa fascism, which feels very real and very live for us. Next slide. So I want to just say how we're doing this in action. We are working um, to build the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, like Sandra and Whitney said, we have a squad in Congress. It's not enough. And these folks are our ceasefire champions, right, who have been challenging um, the logic that, you know, funding Israel um, with weapons and aid is the way to actually promote security for everybody in the region. So we are going to be uh, recruiting and sending volunteers to support squad members that are currently getting challenge from the right and the center. So we have th the three progressive black electeds in the squad, Summer Lee, Jamal Bowman, and Corey Bush, um, who have some of the closest races in their primaries. Summer Lee's race is the first one, and APAC is promising to spend $100 million to unseat the squad. And um, currently, Summer Lee is polling well, but in 2022, APAC spent $5 million against um, Summer Lee, and she only won her seat by 988 votes. So we know that the impact of the APAC money hasn't started to flood the race yet, but it's going to very soon. So we are currently recruiting um, to send volunteers to Pittsburgh from now until April 23rd. We're, we are currently recruiting to send volunteers to um, Corey Bush's district in St. Louis, Missouri, um, so that we can actually uh, also be supporting Cori Bush in her race. And we are um, also confirmed to support Representative um, Jamal Bowman in his district in New York. Um, so if you are interested in getting involved in actually defending our folks who are our champions, who are clearly leading the fight on Green New Deal, on immigrant rights, on you know Green New Jobs, and also ceasefire. Um, we really need to throw down for them and actually have their back. Otherwise, some of the gains that we've made in the last you know few years are just are not going to actually pay off in terms of the building aspect. Right? We need to be able to defend these folks. Can I have the next slide? All right. So here's who we're partnering with in the primaries. We'll be working with. Um, the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance in Pennsylvania, who's targeting API voters, which is a critical kind of uh, voting block. We'll also be working with Pennsylvania United. Um, in New York, we're working with the Working Families Party. And in um, St. Louis, we're working with Action St. Louis. And in terms of the other members of the squad, um, Rashida Tlaib and also Ilhan Omar, uh, right now their races look pretty secure and so we're in conversation with our partners there to kind of see like do we need to mobilize do we need to ring any alarm bells um, but for right now those are still active conversations and we're monitoring their races to see if an influx of volunteers is going to be helpful for them and so this is what we're doing from now until august and then we're transitioning to really recruit heavily to block Trump in November in the general election um, on November 5th. And we're going to be in a couple different um, states. And can I have the next slide? So I think we most folks already know <laughs> what we need to know ahead of Election Day in terms of where we need to be. The outcome of whether we're going to have a fascist for the United States president is actually going to be determined in six battleground states by very narrow margins. And this was true from 2016 until 2022. So these, um, most people are very confident that these are the states in play. So Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. With those states undecided, the electoral vote tally is Trump 235 and Biden 226. So if we want to really prevent a MAGA takeover on the federal government, um, we need to collectively as a movement, but we as seeing the vote are committing to mobilize 
thousands of volunteers to go directly to these swing states to Canvas or to phone bank remotely. And um, like folks said earlier, when the anti-MAGA majority turns out, that's who's going to decide the election. It's not polls. It's not, you know, the, the advertising that's going to be flooding. It's really the people on the doors who are doing grassroots organizing to turn out the voters that will make up the anti-MAGA united front. The next slide. Um, so love this quote from Michael Podhorzer. Folks, you know, don't get his um, Substack weekend reading. It's a great read. Um, but he tells us to remember that the outcome in those states will depend not on the margin of error in polls, but on the margin of effort by campaigns, activists, media, and concerned citizens to mobilize America's anti-MAGA majority. So I feel like this is this is the call to action to all of us who are in that anti-MAGA front to really do everything we can. Because again, sitting out, sitting on the sidelines, that is how the other side wins. And we actually need to mobilize our forces on the left um, and in progressive uh, movement to be a deciding factor in building our own power, but also in blocking MAGA. And I will, um, we can skip actually the next slide and go to the one after, thank you. Um, I just want to say really quickly why canvassing is so important and why we've decided to prioritize that especially in this year. And I'm just gonna give a short example of one of our volunteers named Casey, who was a Seed the Vote volunteer in 2020 and 2022. She first went um, to volunteer in Georgia in 2020, and she was um, actually knocking uh, for the runoff that was happening um, for, this is the post, uh, post Biden getting elected. There was a Georgia runoff to decide who was gonna control the Senate, right? Was it gonna be Republicans or was it gonna be Democrats? Uh, Casey got to the door of an older black woman who had never voted before. She had been registered Democrat for decades, but had never voted and didn't even vote actually in the November 2020 election. Um, Casey stayed with her, asked her questions, talked to her, really listened to her. And by the end of that conversation, um, the voter said, you know, you're right. I do want to vote, actually. Um, and I, I'm going to go do it, actually, because of you. And Casey proceeded to give her a ride to the polling place, um, to wait with her, to give her the support she needed to really go be that the first time she ever voted. Um, and it was in a critical race that did decide the Senate majority. Um, fast forward two more years, Casey went back to Georgia in 2022 again. She still had that voter's number in her phone. And she reached back out to say, hey, I'm back in Georgia. Um, how are you doing? And the woman said, you know, I totally remember you, Casey. I actually talk about you all the time. And ever since that time we voted, I vote in every single election since then. And you're the reason why I vote now. And so I just tell that story because it really makes a huge impact, whether we send out our grassroots army, our people to go to these doors and talk with these really critical voters. Um, and I'll just um, close by saying, with our links, if you can go to the last slide, Josh. Thank you. This is a link tree at the very last slide, which has um, all the links you need to sign up, to follow us. Um, please do um, let us know if you can uh, join us in the fight. We need everybody listening. We need your friends. We need your family. So get involved and hit us up. Thank you. And I'll and back to Caden. Amazing. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I feel like that kind of storytelling really puts a, a human face on this process and why this work is so important. Um, we're going to move to close. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I, we already dropped the link to the full syllabus in the chat, but let's do it again. Um, the full syllabus is available on our website for you to grab right now. Um, there's a downloadable PDF that you can print if you want to use it offline. Um, and we just loaded in some really beautiful layouts uh, for a web, uh, a web native version um, that looks great. Um, check it out at convergencemag.com. Um, and this also seems like a really good time. Josh mentioned it in uh, our segment. Uh, to introduce my new podcast. It's called Block and Build, a weekly roadmap for the left. Um, and I have to say that one of the great privileges of my job is that I get to talk 
to some of the smartest folks working to advance this strategy today. Folks like Emily, who have great stories to tell from the front lines. And I'm really excited to be able to bring conversations right to your headphones um, with them, as well as insight and analysis about what's going on each week as we enter this truly chaotic time. Um, you can get Block and Build now wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you can smash that subscribe button. Uh, ensure you hear our first episode that should be dropping on Friday. Um, last but not least, I also want to make a plug. Um, if you are already a member of Convergence on Patreon, you can watch my weekly interview live while it happens. Um, and jump into the chat. And if you would like to become a member of Convergence, you can do that at patreon.com slash Convergence Mag. Um, we are a small independent publication and we really rely on folks like you to keep us going. Um, last but not least, uh, shout out to everybody who appeared on this evening's live stream. Sandra Hinson, Whitney Maxey, members of our editorial board, uh, Josh Elstro, our audio producer, and Emily Jaming Lee from Seed the Vote. Josh Elstro also served as the producer for this live stream. Um, big thanks to our ASL interpreters, Jonah and Edward. Um, the slides that you saw from Whitney and Sandra were designed by Karina Hurtado Ocampo, additional graphic design by Mac Brown, um, and if you haven't already, please follow both Convergence and Seed the Vote wherever it is you keep up with political organizations. Uh, I'll just say that Seed the Vote will continue, as Emily said, to have amazing opportunities for you to plug into the practical work of Block and Build this year. And this is really an all hands on deck moment. Um, they're canvassing right now for Summer Lee. I just talked to some awesome people who are here from the Bay Area who are headed to Pittsburgh. Um, and this is a, a great opportunity to make these, uh, these political principles into political practice. Um, with that, again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the internet.